to get our session going, we have three faculty facilitators that are here today to share what they're doing in terms of juggling chainsaws as rotting in a unicycle. So you're gonna hear from Brandy Brooks, who's joining us from engineering, as well as Brandis Keller, who's joining us from engineering. And Sharon Matthews is joining us from Education's Teaching, Learning, and Culture Department. So here in just a minute, we'll turn it over to them to share. You have a whole army of us here from the center who are just here to help moderate, answer questions, keep the conversation going. So each one of us will help with just the chat and taking care of any questions that come up while our faculty facilitators are sharing and then once we get into breakout groups. So we have pre, three simple outcomes for today's session. One is really, this is just a time, a very informal, interactive share time for you to discover different student engagement strategies that your peers are using in this, what we refer to as blended synchronous classroom environment, where you have some people in Zoom and some people face-to-face give you a little bit of time to reflect on what you're hearing and, and think about would that work for you in your context, as well as possibly ask some questions to help get a better feel about that. So that ultimately you leave here with some boots on the ground ideas that you could use tomorrow in your class. And so that's really the purpose of this. Um, we were talking about beforehand that community colleges have been teaching this way for quite some time. But those of us at really tier one R1 institutions, we're not so used to teaching this way. And so this is really a time for us to come together with colleagues, see what others are doing to hopefully glean and take away some ideas from the session. There will be three parts. We'll open, like we said, with our, our faculty facilitators sharing what they have found to be effective. We'll spend a, a bulk of time in breakout groups where you can share with smaller groups and hear from others in, in a more small setting where you can ask questions, throw out ideas. And then after that breakout group session time, we'll come back and debrief, share some more ideas, and then have a Q&A time if there's any remaining at the end. Because we're a pretty good sized session, we've muted everybody but the presenter's microphone, but we don't want to distract you or d deter you from asking questions. So please, please use the chat function. If any questions come up, that's why there's a small army of us from the center to help moderate that. As well as when we do get into the breakout group, we will be using a Google Doc to help capture the ideas that are being shared. So once the session is over, we'll be happy to share with you the slide deck, the Google Doc of strategies that were shared, as well as a link to the session's recording, if that will help you. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Randy, who's gonna share with you how he uses Zoom breakout rooms in his blended synchronous. So Randy, I'm gonna let you introduce yourself and turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Sam. I'm Randy Brooks from the uh, Engineering Academies. I teach at the Academy uh, of Lynn College in Brenham. Uh, throughout the summer, I had a lot of consulting groups I went to. I took some classes with CTE, uh, worked with some uh, profs here at Blend, uh, worked with the engineering profs weekly. We had a meeting, and then even the academy profs really kind of had a little focal group. Uh, so through some of that conversation, uh, I got some direction about really kind of how I needed to teach the courses. I teach the, the first three engineering courses in a sequence. All three are team related. The first one where we bring the freshmen in, uh, really heavily team driven. So I was kind of battling with how do I make the income, because I'm doing in person and online, how do I make those experiences similar? Uh, so I've gone down the path of, and it's been received pretty well, especially with the freshmen, a little more difficult with the upperclassmen uh, of having, uh, setting up the team. So I have a class of 40, uh, have teams of four. I require them, because uh, I, I queried them before I had the class, I said, so who's interested in coming to class, who'd rather stay away, so I could kind of build that into the team. Uh, vast majority actually wanted to come to class, so I was able to say, uh, here's your teams, you need to have one representative in class each time. Uh, the remaining can be remote. Uh, allows me to interface with some of the students and then have a contact into each group. Uh, I was able to build those teams, which is a nice feature into Zoom, uh, those are constant teams. I could build them in to do an automatic load when I'm ready to roll them to teams. Uh, I've somewhat flipped the class. I do, still do some lecture, but I somewhat flipped it to have them do a lot of the lecture outside so that when I got them here, 
uh, we're working teams really the full time. Uh, but working through that Zoom view, having them join through Canvas, uh, have not had a lot of difficulties with that. I probably had five students that really kind of need to work through some challenges. As freshmen, we wanted to kind of give them that guidance so they're established on the really kind of the team leader is in the room. But as it's evolved, a team leader could be anywhere and you get the questions posed. We've learned pretty quickly, uh, need to keep microphones and speakers muted. Uh, everybody is now bringing either earbuds or headphones so they get that piece managed. Uh, so once I kind of kick the group off, uh, I will walk the room to talk to the talk to the students in the room. If they have some questions, I can I can at that point on the students' machine join their chat room from from the students' perspective, or I can come back to my main machine and go around to the different rooms. If I'm not getting a lot of questions here, I'll drop into the different rooms to see what kind of activity is going on, uh, and you kind of see what I typically see in my regular classroom that they work differently. Some uh, you get into and it's full on talking and they're sharing screens. Uh, I learned pretty quickly how to go through that because we share that quite a bit in our practices. Uh, and some of them are just quiet, quiet working. You kind of go around to them, you can talk to them with chat. Uh, a lot of the, the deal was set up nicely uh, in our first class that we had uh, was really kind of two hours introducing students to college uh, and are probably, they don't talk a whole lot in the big group, right? Because they're a little concerned with that. So probably the chat room for seven or eight questions, right? To put them in a chat room of three or four, they kind of talk through what they encountered, they come back and they'll share it in a grouping. So have pretty good success really with the freshmen. Uh, the upper class are coming in there. It's a little more difficult class because it's a really a hands-on lab as opposed to a programming lab. Uh, but after the second week, they'll, they've been coming in this week and starting uh, to kind of understand that the, the person in the lab has to do the work and the people remote need to need to be given that data so they could start working with the data so they're engaged. It was kind of first the tough times we went through software, but really the next labs are going into, you go in and you just start working. So you got the hands-on activity going on. He's got it filmed on Zoom. Again, they're in breakout rooms the same way there. Uh, and as he pulls data, he can give it to the remotes and then go on to his next task and not have to evaluate it. They can tell him if it's good or not. Kind of one that I fostered from talking to a lot of peers over the summer. And uh, really wanted to have that consistency between the in-person and the remote experience. And I feel like I'm getting pretty close. I'm not gonna be there completely because some students just really have to have that in, uh, but I feel like I'm getting pretty close with that. That's kind of been my experience. I'll uh, pass it on to the next. All right, Randy, thank you. So if I heard you correctly, you use Teams in breakout rooms with one person as the team leader in class. Do you find that they just rotate who that in-person class is or do they typically send the same person every time? I've encouraged them to rotate. They could talk within the group, but some groups may get to this point where maybe a couple of them or maybe three of them just don't feel comfortable coming to class and I'll respect that and say that's fine. And then the one person will continue to come. I'm gonna turn it over to Brandis Keller. Thank you for being here, Brandis. I'll let you introduce yourself and then talk us through what you have found to be effective in this blended synchronous environment. Hello, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Uh, my name is Dr. Brandis Keller. I'm an instructional assistant professor in biomedical engineering. This past semester, I've actually um, not been heavily teaching load, but in the prior semester during the shift to online, I got the firsthand experience of how to put a lab into this remote learning environment. And so one of the things that I'm covering today and, and I, I thought would be a great highlight for this group was how we could consider use of these collaboration tools that are so amazing and, and offered through the Canvas um, learning management system, right? I personally enjoy both participating and providing activities that allow group thought. Um, that being, in other words, activities that are intended to provide continuity of documenting thoughts and creating essentially collaborative documents in the classroom. And in my mind, this should work for both small and or large groups, you know, so allowing development and expansion um, in a specific activity or even across the entire semester. And so that's what I'm hoping to cover today, and I look forward to whoever's joining me in my group. Um, so for a large group, I've actually participated myself in uh, the ID8 community uh, on Canvas, and we have within Canvas, it's embedded a Google Doc, whereby we can 
discuss over different meetings and expand on our community goals on notes from our little internal workshops right and so um, and I foresaw that using it in the classroom that somebody can maybe develop a portfolio right or in writing a paper that you can be guiding them through that or even note taking and so that's where um, you can definitely see large or small, depending on how you want to set it up. Yeah, that's a that's a nice idea. I've heard of several instructors using what we call back channeling during class in Google Docs, where there's like a class notes document that, similar to Randy's, you take turns being the class leader or your group leader. Instructors will have students take turns being the class note taker in that group Google Doc that can then be shared both with students in class or students outside of class. So that's another great idea. Um, I know some instructors also use Google Docs instead of the chat function in Zoom as a way to ask questions and whatnot and have a way to, to keep up with that a little easier than the, the chat window in Google. So thank you for that, Brandis. All right, next we're gonna hear from Sharon Matthews. So Sharon, thank you for being here and I'll turn it over to you. Hi everybody, I'm excited to be here with you today and I really appreciate these great ideas. Um, for me, the blended class that I'm teaching is um, a group of seniors who are in a methods class. They are a bit mourning that loss of being able to go into schools, and this is an eight o'clock class in the morning. Something that's really important for me then is to have a brisk pace to the class, and we need to get started right at eight o'clock and just begin to kind of infuse that energy that we typically have in the face-to-face -face setting. Um, I don't have as many students who are attending um, in person. And so I really noticed that a lot of my students would log into Zoom and then because they're at home and they're quite comfortable, they lean back a bit. And so my thought was I needed a way to encourage them to lean into the class and to activate background knowledge at the same time. So one of the ways that um, seems to be working very well for my students is to use Jamboard. This is a Google extension um, that um, Sam has uh, done a nice job of kind of making sure that you can find it. And um, she has put that in the, um, the link in the chat so that you can see it. And then we can go out and our Jamboard will come up and you all can participate. Too many people. Okay, I've not encountered that problem before. That's a new thing. So when you come back to it later, let me talk you through a bit of what it is. Um, what I did today is that I simply had students talk to me a little bit about what they might celebrate during this week four of classes and um, kind of getting them started. And then what I like about the Jamboard, for those of you who are viewing, if you go up to the top, you'll see there's a little screen up there and it says one of three. So you can click on that little right arrow and you'll see that there are actually two other pages that will pop up for you. Um, and which is, I think, very useful to kind of move away from where I started today with you know, what, how have you grown as an instructor? What are those kinds of things that you're experiencing? And then moving over to what I did this morning with my students, which was a content question. So I did kind of an anticipation guide with them this morning. I posed a question and they had to declare an answer. Either they agreed with what I had noted or they disagreed with what I noted and they kind of had to then defend that stance. So if I find that Jamboard is a, a really fun and simple and low stakes way to get students to, to participate and engage very early, and then it allows us to change that format to a little bit of higher stakes where they have to actually start to use some of the readings from the class and you know, show how they're prepared and then kind of also hearing their teacher voice, it needs to come into play a bit. Um, and so I hope that you will you know, give Jamboard a try. I have never encountered this problem before, but I think it's pretty exciting that um, we have so many people who are attempting to get on there. Um, it has worked well in my class and everybody's had an easy time getting in touch with it. Sharon, how many students do you have in each of your classes? So the current seniors that I have, there are only 25. Um, these are English language arts, social studies majors. Um, and so it's a, it's a much smaller group than this one. I wonder if we, we'll do a little bit of research on the back end and see, oh, there it is. Jean said there must be, uh, Max is 50. And so the nice thing about Jamboard, Sharon, is there a way to know who has posted? Do they post anonymously? Do they add their name? Is there a way to track 
who's posted what? So what I do in the moment actually is ask them to put their name so that I can call out to people. Um, and that's how I've spent most of my time kind of using Jamboard because I was using it as a low stakes tool. Um, and so that's primarily my, my use for it. Perfect, thank you. I know others have dropped into chat things like Padlet and Miro, mm -hmm. which are, are similar type um, free interactive boards. So Jamboard, Padlet, Miro are all within that same vein. The nice thing about Jamboard is it is embedded in our Tamu Google Suite, but with a limit of 50, it, whether you can use it or not, or you pair up your students and they do one response if you have more than 50. So there's, there's ways to get around that limit. But the nice thing is you can get to it within our Google Suite if that is something you're interested with in maintaining. So thank you, Sharon, for sharing. I, I appreciate that. This was a new one for me. I hadn't played with this one, so I had a <laughs> big time. All right, so with that, I'm going to move on and turn it over to Nate, who's gonna take you into the next section of our session. Thank you, Sam. So uh, right now we're gonna start our breakout session uh, component. We're gonna put you into about six person groups. We'll give you about 20 minutes uh, to kind of discuss. And this is uh, designed to sort of like a, a free flowing brainstorming kind of throw your ideas out there kind of deal. I am teaching an undergraduate course for the first time in a long time. I know I picked a great semester to start doing it. Um, but, you know, I'm the one that added writing a unicycle to the title because the first three weeks have felt like exactly like juggling chainsaws and riding a unicycle. So I am hoping to, you know, figure out a lot of things from you all in these uh, group uh, breakout sessions. Uh, there will be an automatic timer and these are the settings that we recommend uh, you use when uh, whenever you do a breakout session uh, and it's also a good practice to kind of prep people before you just send them off um, the rooms will automatically end and bring you back and then we will reconvene and debrief um, but before we uh, get to your breakout session uh, we do have a google form that uh, one of my colleagues will put into the chat for me and uh, we actually learned this from Katrina Laporte and uh, we kind of added a little bit to it. And the breakout rooms, uh, we're gonna ask you to kind of come up with uh, group roles. And this is a good modeling of how to keep groups accountable in a breakout room setting. So uh, each of uh, you in the group should have a role and uh, you know, identify that role uh, in your group. And as we scroll down the form, so each group will only you know, submit one form. We do have a question that we want to kind of have you think about, and that is, you know, use this space to kind of think of some of the strategies that you've used. And there are, I think, six different uh, blanks down there for you to kind of fill out. And this is a good way for us to capture different ideas, but uh, if you're doing this in your classroom, it's also a good way to give, uh, you know, credit to low stakes assessment or informal assessment to your students. Uh, I know that, uh, you know, if I don't give my students enough guideline or framework, they, I don't know what they're doing in the, in, in the group until I pop in, but if you give them a form and a deliverable at the end, then there's a little bit more motivation and accountability. So. 